Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome my class, the History of Israel. I welcome all of you on Zoom um, for our conversation with uh, filmmaker Yael Perlov today. And um, I would just like to also mention uh, the Americans for Ben Gurion University have been very helpful in uh, arranging this event. Um, my name is Michael Brenner. I teaching this class, History of Israel, I'm director of the Center for Israel Studies at American University. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you um, to uh, join us in our conversation, especially I'd like to welcome um, filmmaker uh, Yael Perlov. Yael is a film producer and film editor and a two-time laureate of the Israeli Film Academy Award Ophir Prize for editing the film Late Marriage that was in 2001, um, as well as for editing and producing the film which all of us watched, Ben Gurion, um, Epilogue, winner of the best documentary film in 2016. And she also has initiated, produced, and edited many documentary films and projects, many of which discuss and research also the Holocaust and the generation of the survivors. In fact, that's also the topic of her most recent documentary film, um, um, which is The Partisan with the Leica Camera, which just came out this year, the story of a Jewish partisan and uh, photographer during World War II. Yael is also dedicated to the artistic heritage of her late father, one of Israel's most prominent filmmakers, David Perlov, uh, who passed away in 2003. She is a lecturer at the film department of uh, Tel Aviv University and has been teaching film editing there since 1995. In addition to that, she taught students in various film institutes and universities from Moscow to London to most recently Duke University. The documentary we all watched is a remarkable interview with the founder of the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, um, an interview which takes place in 1968, just to say a word about the setting. It is shortly after he lost his long time wife, Paula. It is one year after um, Israel changed forever, at least until now, with the Six Day War in 1967. It is also after he is no longer active in politics uh, and he was the dominant uh, figure in Israeli politics for over 15 years. So maybe we'll start with the story of how it came to this film. I think it's a quite uh, unique story how um, this uh, interview, which was made in 1968, was kind of lost or forgotten and only remembered and came back a few years ago. Uh, I'd love for you to start with the story. Okay, so firstly, uh, hello everybody. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here in Washington and I'm very honored uh, to let you know some stories around this film. So uh, actually uh, it began with my father, as Michael said, because uh, once he passed away, I decided to take upon myself the restoration of his films. My father didn't make a lot of films. He was born in Brazil, uh, immigrated to Israel during the 50s, and his first film were mostly, uh, you know, uh, uh, films for the, um, you know, propaganda films, let's say it like this, because it was just the, mm -hmm. the beginning of the States. So uh, he made some propaganda films, uh, and then uh, in uh, the films that he made about Ben Gurion, it was uh, a film that uh, was based on an interview that we found. And how did we find that interview? I wanted to restaurate the film that he did, which was a fiction film mixed with some scenes, documentary scenes. But I had, you know, the VHS cassette. Do you still have an idea? <laughs> I know that it's not you, but I had a, a video cassette VHS and it was written very, you know, vaguely 
426, the name of this film, I will explain later what is very Ben Gurion film. So I found a yellow, yellow, you know, with a lot of, you know, not nice <laughs> copy of this film. And uh, I began to require, together with uh, a colleague of mine, Yariv Moser, uh, where, where is the film? Then we understood that the film, we, we realized, not understood, we realized that the film was in the Spielberg archive in Jerusalem, at the Jerusalem University. So we went there and we found a pile of boxes, which Ben Gurion interviewed. 35 millimeters, do you know what does it mean? 35 millimeter guys. Okay, I will explain, don't, don't panic. <laughs> I will explain. 35 millimeters, it was the old uh, system of shooting uh, heavy cameras, good quality of image. And we found these piles of, of reels, uh, but there was no sound, which means that we could see Ben Guyon mute, and cannot hear what he says. Eventually, we had the stenogram, the the script of the, the stenogram script, the script, all the interview. We had it on paper, so we just could divide, div, um, guess what does it say. But you can imagine how frustrated it was. So Minja Rivi decided to ask to all the all the archive in the world. We took a picture of the of the film from the Steinbeck, from the editing room, mm. and just asked one question: Where is the sound? After several weeks, we got an answer that there is a quarter inch tapes, which was used. I will explain it to you in the radio or also in cinema, mm -hmm. which were found in the south of the country in the Negev. <laughs> we took a taxi straight to the archive. And we saw that the same name, the same details of the cameraman, the date, which was very important, are the same. So bingo. Then it took us some weeks to synchronize it. And we discovered six hours of interview that were divided in two cameras, which means that it's a little bit less because it's double. You must understand there was no television yet in Israel. The television just appeared one year later, or even two years later, during the early 70s. So uh, uh, it was shot in two different angles that I used a lot, and in 35 millimeter. The sound, what happened to the sound? Quarter inch is boxes that were used to the radio and to the cinema, all cinema was based on image and sound, they were not together. It's not like today with, thanks God, <laughs> with our cell phones, but before 40 years, not that much time, it was separated. So we got the name of the, what, the man who recorded it, okay? And he lived in London. So we traveled to London and we found this guy and he was this, the, the he was the sound recorder of Kubrick film, Odyssea, Bachalal, Odyssea, yeah, uh, uh, Odyssea 2001, and he's the one who recorded the sound for Geshe uh, Nahar Kwai, uh, the bridge on the uh, river Kwai. So he was quite a famous sound recorder. He told us he didn't find the negative, so he gave as distribution to the Institute of Ben Gurion in the Negev, but nobody found it. So 50 years, the image, the reels were in Jerusalem, the sound was at the south, and nobody saw to. So we understood that we have a treasure. So what I decided and is- that was that, almost 50 years after it was- 50 or 40, 40 something. 40 something mm. between, among 46, yeah. 50 years, but the, nobody found it. So once we found it, there was also one question, who is the one who interviewed him? We found his name on the script and thanks God he's alive, <laughs> 80 years old. He was in Greece, why we called him, he was in vacations. He was, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, so I'm an American guy, Jewish American guy, and I, I swear to you, honestly, what I tell you is the truth. He, he immigrated to Israel. And then in Israel, he walked, he was looking for a job. 
He walked in the boulevard just in front of Ben Gurion house in Zderot Ben Gurion. I recommend you to visit this house because it's very humble and nice place. And then Paula, the wife of Ben Gurion saw him and said, hey, come on, young guy. <laughs> he entered and said, I'm looking for a job. You will have a meeting tomorrow with my husband. And then he said to him, and I swear to you, this uh, real story. And, and uh, she asked, and she asked him, what are you doing? I'm looking for a job. Okay, they have a meeting the day after. And Ben Gurion himself told him that he would like to invite him to the South because he would like him to teach English. So he joined Ben Gurion to the South, to the Negev. He, he, he was a professor of English language, the English language. Then he became a specialist of the Bedouin language. He spoke very, he speaks till today, very well Arabic in a Yiddish accent. <laughs> I mean, he's a, and he knows very well the, the history of the Bedouin because he was in the South. And as I see today, Mr. Clinton, Ben Gurion really liked him. He was his uh, student in a way. I found it even deeper. I think that he looked at him as one of his sons, in a way. I mean, not really, but it was very disciplined. And what we understood while watching the rushes before this, the, the, uh, knowing this interviewer, we understood that there is something intimate between Ben Gurion and Clinton Bailey. So this is the whole story. Quite a story. <laughs> yeah, we just you know it, it was a puzzle. Yeah. Something about well the kind of intimacy also of Israeli society at the right. time the it was a very different state uh, and society than today and also about you know making up last minute a lot of things yeah but I also um there is of course also another dimension to the story because it involves your father and him yeah. making a film yeah. um but a very unique film not just a biography of David Ben-Gurion. Maybe yeah. you can tell us about the 42-6 film. So it was a fiction, it's, it's a good question. It's a fiction made in 69. And how was it connected to the interview? Because the producer of the film suggested to interview Ben-Gurion three days, two hours a day successively in order to write the script for the fiction. While watching my father's film, I realized that it was really one-to-one. -one. I mean, it was really based, the script of the fiction was really based on the, the interview. What the, what the producer wanted to make from this interview, that's what we understood yet later, that he wanted to take, you know, sequence of this, some minutes, and just to sell it as mm -hmm. Ben Gurion speaks on that, Ben Gurion speaks on that, you know, this is one of his business. That's what we realized yet. But the script that my father realized, it was similar one-to-one -to, -one to the interview. That's why I used in the film some clips of my father's film, because my father mixed together the genre, yes, the fiction and documentary together and one of his character was Ben Gurion itself. It it actually I, is accessible in the Israeli film archives yeah. uh, for free for everyone online but I think you brought us also a clip. Uh, yeah. Is it easy to watch it? We can maybe uh, then that's of the film of David Perloff of 1969 which is called 42.6. Why is it called 42.6? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I have it in the details. It's a quotation of uh, Josh Ishayahu. Yeah, J Isaiah. Yeah, which means Orla Goim. Yeah, the light unto the T nations. Yeah, I think today I don't know, understand why. why he I would it. like to ask my father, <laughs> why did he put this name? It's uh, yeah. it's quite enigmatic, but well, I actually, know the answer. So the, I, 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 I don't know the answer, but, uh, but for David Ben-Gurion, Israel always. It was very important for him that Israel was a light into the nation, exemplary yeah. state, a state that would be an example to all other states. Uh, I don't know if it's related to that. Um, if we can show the clip, it's about four minutes. I would just say one word about this film. It was shot by Adam Greenberg, who is the DPO of the Terminator 1, the Terminator <laughs> 2. He was a good friend of my father, a Polish DPO. 
came immigrate to Israel and then left to Hollywood and then he became quite mm. famous. So you can Google it. Mm. A very nice guy. I, he was a good friend of my father and he is the DPO of this film. And we are going to screen the very first minutes of the beginning. Mm -hmm. Kill the lights, maybe? Yeah, we can. Yeah, one moment. Let's see, first in the door. One more. <laughs> Here we go.
see it's beginning it's 48 so that's it we can stop it we can stop it yeah it's this is the mandate. The British you, leaving. The British okay, leaving. Yeah. It here. It's based yeah. on on episodes, right? Of yeah. Episodes. But yeah. you also, I think, uh, in the just when they showed uh, the names of all people involved, it shows something about the color effects in the film. Yeah. It seems very. It seems very modernist and very yeah. um, innovative for the yeah. time yeah is that yeah uh, so anyway everybody can see the film i, I want to go back so there is a relation between the interview which was six hours of course the ben-gurion the edited film is only one hour ben-gurion epilogue um, but there is this relation between this interview and the film uh, one of 1969 um, can we actually, can you tell us something about the five hours which we cannot see in the David Ben-Gurion epilogue? Yeah. Well, I will speak a little bit about the editing as I edited. It was a, a long journey. Uh, I edited it in the south near Ben-Gurion near the Ben-Gurion Institute to be close to the archive. Like this, we were mm. sure that we are not making mistakes, you know, historical mistake to be very precise. Mm -hmm. So it took us uh, six months living in the desert. Every day I walked like Ben Guyon, <laughs> 40 minutes at the morning and just to imitate him because he influenced a lot yeah. my, you know, my thoughts during the editing. So um, the editing, I, I want to speak a little bit to generalize a little bit. What we did is, to, you know, we wanted to not to be too much didactic. What I mean, we, our first decision the first decision was not to put any short, real short, not interview from today, just to use the archive material. So we had six hours, but there are some other materials that are in the film that we found during the editing. For example, uh, I decided when we had when he speaks about Buddhism, we will see archive of Ben Gurion in in the East. You know, so. In a way, Ben Gurion leads me during the editing. I was listening carefully to what he said, and while choosing the extracts of the interview, we looked for the archive material that relate to it. Yeah. And the second thing is, you know, it's like Hungarian Cube. It's going back and forth. You know the game of the children, the Ubi Hungary. Okay, it's called Hungarian Cube. Yes, in, in English, it's a different name, but. That yeah. which meant that not deducted he was born and then he died, mm -hmm. but to make it, you know, back and forth mm -hmm. uh, in the editing. So like this, we can mm -hmm. keep the audience mm -hmm. attentive to us. That was the... Uh, and, yeah. and of course, to put it in a larger context again of Ben-Gurion's life, uh, as I said before, he had retired, but uh, in a very unusual way for, let's say, an American or European politician, uh, he retired... Um, by, in a way, fulfilling his youth, his, the ideals of his youth, and going, settling in a kibbutz in the Negev, in the south of Israel, in the desert, leading a very simple life, working. You see in the film that these are some of the scenes where he works in, in the stable with the animals or in the fields, and um, that's what he wanted to do and did in a way for the last years of his life, uh, starting in his 70s, to be a simple worker, only call, be called David, David. And, um, and, and, and of course, there were many people who came and visited him, but uh, that was the life of the time uh, at that time. And um, I would like to add, if yes, you may, uh, one scene that I, till now I regret not putting it, it was the funeral of Ben Gurion mm. uh, because it was the um, big question. Because on one hand, we did want to finish the film with the funeral, but on the other hand, the TV, the TVs, they wanted to fi to finish to, to to finish the film with something optimistic. Yeah. So I edited sequence of the funeral. I found fantastic sound. There was the coffin in front of the parliament. All Israel passed there. Mm. There was a siren. We all stood. And then the helicopter took the coffin to the south. Mm -hmm. Just, I want to put things in context. It was three months after Yom Kippur War. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, what he asked Ben Guyon that after his death, there will be no ceremonies. So there were only few, very few uh, members of the parliament there uh, in the Negev. There were no shooting, there was nothing. There was no ceremony. They were just, I think, also very traumatized by the war of Yom Kippur. And it was a very simple and humble, I would rather say humble, ceremony. And, and it was well edited, <laughs> let's say. But finally, we decided to finish it in a more, more uh, uh, happy or let's say yeah. optimistic way. It's, a, it, yeah. it's an interesting contrast to what's just going on as we speak, which is yeah. the Queen's funeral exactly. in, in London this minute. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, but we see a little some scenes of Paulas of his wife's funeral in, yes. in there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, no, that 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 is really very interesting, and maybe we can talk a little bit about Ben Gurion. What I found very interesting is that he doesn't, at least in this one hour, he doesn't talk that much about politics. He talks about life and philosophy and Buddhism and how he learns to make a headstand. And uh, and actually, these are one of the, I think, amazing scenes also, yeah. which we can see. Um, when you released this, when this came out in Israel, um, I'm just curious, does he still have... Is, did it have a lot of significance, especially for the younger generation in Israel? What was your, what was the reception? Mm-hmm. So thank you for this question because um, it's it's a very moving uh, situation. It was a very, I, I'm mother of two children and I, I, I didn't know how will they react to that. Okay, so I always thought about them while editing it. They're approximately your age, guys. So uh, according to our distribution, it was screened at cinema halls, okay? In cinema halls, what the distributor was a very professional one, he said, it will begin with the grandmother and the grandfather, and it will end it with the grandchildren. So the grandmother will bring the grandchild, and am I clear, right? Mm-hmm. And then, and that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. We saw at the cinema halls, grandfather, grandchildren, and the little children, and, and even, I had some reactions that everybody came out with one sentence, quotation of one sentence of him. Uh-huh. So I can ask you guys, what do you, what will you take with you? What sentence? For example, okay, let's start. Who will be the first one that you remember that you can take with you? Tomorrow. Okay, yes. So I think the sentence where the interviewer goes to him, you led Israel, and he goes, I didn't lead Israel, I led myself. And he didn't see it as like taking everyone behind him. He took it as his own moral and that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's very, very moving sentence and humble also. That's which means maybe you can put it in context of Zionism, that it was not okay, it was him, but it was part of a very revolutionary yeah. movement yeah. in a way and we forget yeah, and by the way do we always have to should we repeat uh, because the audience can't hear the students without the mic yeah. so we usually repeat the okay. Okay. question okay. so the answer yeah. um so that was where he said i didn't lead israel i led myself um we also shouldn't forget that ben gurion of course was a zionist from early on and he says in the film he was reborn in israel when after he immigrated as a young man, but also he was a socialist, and that also were some of his ideals. Um, um, yes, uh, but here I see another hand, Carlton, in the yeah. back. Uh, yeah, I definitely don't have this quote verbatim, but when uh, he's sort of talking about some of his last actions as prime minister and also his thoughts on things like the Six-Day War, um, and he says, you know, I guess if I could either have, you know, hegemony or peace, I would rather have peace. Yes, uh, so I repeat it for the audience on screen. Um, that's when he was asked if basically it's about returning the territories which Israel conquered in 67. What's the alternative if to keep it or to have peace, to have the territories of peace? And he's very clear in his answer. He says, return it and I would rather have peace. Um, yes, and Christian. Um, one part that stood out to me was when he's sort of reflecting on sort of political system Israel and he says something like yes democracy leads to mistakes 
but it's better to make mistakes as a democracy than to uh than under right wing or better mistake better make mistakes than right oh uh, yeah that's right he said better mis make better to make mistakes in democracy than a right wing and that that of course Again, 1968, there was no right-wing government yet in Israel. The first one was in the, his kind of arch enemy, Menachem Begin, who was the opposition leader for many decades, came only in 1977. And uh, for Ben-Gurion, it was always the nightmare that the right-wing would come to power. Yes. Yeah. I don't have to quote for but he said he wanted to live in a world where there's peace among nations and the only expectation is to help us with neighbors. I thought that was really, really profound. Yeah. Yes, that uh, the world you would live in is like a world with peace with his neighbors. That's that's the most important issue. So so you get a sense of his outlook. Um, anyone else? Yes, Sophie? For me, the part that stuck out the most is when the interviewer was asking him, like, if you're not a Zionist, then what are you? And he opened up his, like, sentence by saying, well, first, I'm a Jew who, you know, like, wants the best for my country and, like, wants to see the world at peace. And I just thought that was really interesting because it's, like, even at that time, I feel like he was starting to sense this shift in the conception of Zionism. And, you know, like for him to come out and so strongly say, no, I'm not a Zionist. I have my own independent opinions as a Jew who loves my country. I just thought that was like really, really powerful. Yeah. So he basically was asked about Zionism. He say, I, I did my part of Zionism. I immigrated. I live here. I made Aliyah. I live in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel now. Um, that's my Zionism. And first, it, that was very interesting. I think that's for not the answer most Israelis would give today. First yeah. and foremost, I am a Jew, he says. Uh, I don't know, Yael, if you want to comment any of this. I agree with all of you. These are the really uh, strong sentences. I will say also, I will add to you, because while editing, we were very moved by all of your sentence. But I will add also the end when he said, uh, it's only the beginning. You know, as an Israeli born, Sabra, born in Israel, I didn't feel like that. I think, you know, we are here, but it puts my life into context. That's, first of all, it's optimistic because there is future. It's, uh, we can still make mistakes because in the beginning, we all make mistakes. We are pioneers of ideas, you know, so we can make, and uh, I thought about my children. I mean, it's only the beginning. We can keep going and see what's going on, what will happen. So that's the only thing that I will add to your beautiful sentence I quoted. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to show you is that we understood, I understood while, uh, while watching the film again and again with the people, because I made a lot of screening around, uh, a lot of screening all over. Every one of the, of the spectators, they, they take, one of them take a sentence, which can lead, we can be, you know, something that can, and light. So uh, that's all. Um, let's see other Q and A's who would already also give us. But but anyone who also gives like a sentence of this or more questions. So let's uh, for a moment. Let's wait with the questions. We'll take them in a few minutes. Um, I actually also all of you, if you have questions, which I hope you do. It's also a good time to think about them. Yes, Sophie? I guess since this was taken at the end of his life, and at this point in his life, he was living this like sort of like fanatical, almost like ascetic lifestyle that's, you know, like is common for some leaders, but it's still seen as seen sort of, you know, extreme and like that sort of like return to your roots. Like, I guess my two questions are like, um, you spent a lot of time with him in a way, like, you know, like really editing this film. What was your impression of his mental state at this time? Because he did make a lot of statements, despite the fact that it wasn't inherently political. He did say a lot of like morally damning things about the future of the country, uh, which I thought were interesting. He passed like a lot of like very black and white moral judgment. Like when he was talking about like Moshe Bayat, like he was saying like, they are doing the wrong thing, which was another thing that I found very interesting. But yeah, I guess like, what was your opinion on like his mental state and like 
what was the reception of it? Were people kind of just like writing him off as like this old man who was like just like living on a kibbutz and like was rambling? Or when this came out, were they like mm -hmm. sort of seeing him as like taking him more seriously? So I just repeat it for the audience, um, and I, I, I make it shorter, of course. Uh, basically, uh, no, that's okay. Um, it was a very good question, or a couple of questions about his mental state at the time, because he was very clear of writing off or kind of even bitter about politicians following him. Uh, that was known, of course, at the time. And then also, so it's so about his mental state, and also, um, what did people now when you say when it came out because it only came out in 2016 uh, is that when you mean well, yeah okay what did people think uh then did they how serious how important that was for the piece mm -hmm. well i think the film it was very clear that we wanted all israel all kind of people in israel because there are a lot of variated opinions in israel you know small country but a lot of parties everybody's against everybody <laughs> so uh, it was clear for us that you know, it will not be only for the left or for the right it will be for all because we wanted to influence we took upon ourselves a great decision to make this film and to try to to influence according to reviews and to, and to the reception so even the arabs living in israel we spin it a lot to the this society and the reactions were very interesting. So this leads me while editing the film, not only to put it on one, but to put it, the two as much as much as I could. Concerning his mood, uh, he was not young. And old people, sometimes they get angry very easily. <laughs> so I thought it's it was interesting because we must be honest with the material. So of course, it's a person of black and white because he's kind of revolutionary, you know. So uh, I tried to choose things that interest me first of all, and then to open it while looking for other archive material, and also to your mother who made together the film with me. So we, it's a kind of intuitions and things that we didn't know ourselves as sabras. Mm -hmm. For example, his influence with Buddha, his visitors, is is great great respect for intellectuals i found it very interesting there is a passage of this well he collected all the intellectuals i mean the poets and writers to listen to them to respect them to get advice to understand what's going on and so there were some sequences that we choose among these six hours firstly they were important to the future secondly we liked them and and uh, and also we try to put some uh, new uh, new ideas. What we couldn't put, and this I also regret, and according to your uh, previous question, is was the Eichmann trial, for example. The Eichmann trial was a big event in Israel. He this he brought Eichmann to Israel. Maybe you can put it freely and. He didn't like TV at all. He didn't like newspaper. He didn't like communication. But in this very case, uh, special case, he put all the radio and the TV to shoot the, uh, the trial. We had very interesting material and a very interesting uh, interview with him. But finally, we didn't put it. So uh, because after it was shown to all these uh, to, as a post-trauma event, he closed everything. He opened to close. Mm. So in this case, we, 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 I added a very interesting sequence, but alas, we didn't put it. So oh, these be. are things that, you know, back and forth yeah. in the editing. And of course, the limit of time. Yeah, that could be maybe uh, another Yeah, the limit film. of time. TV is very disciplined. You cannot do whatever you want. And sometimes it's good to be more accurate and more precise. And he was very accurate. I, I, I found actually most remarkable in the documentary, in the conversation, how universal it was. It yeah. was, and of course, uh, he's, when he's asked about himself, he says, I'm a Jew, Israeli, but it's so much more. And it's yeah. not a narrow outlook. I think that's what he probably also would think of his opponent, 
uh, Menachem Begin at the time was very mm -hmm. dominated, of course, through his own experience, his family experience, through the Holocaust. Um, and for Ben Gurion, it was, of course, important. But from what I take away is uh, there is a whole world and we are part of that world. And uh, so there are these scenes when he talks about visiting uh, Burma, Unun, who was then oh, no. the Unun, who was then the leader of Burma, and I mean he stayed there for a few weeks for like a yoga retreat yeah. while he was prime minister. That's an yeah. incredible thinking, imagining yeah. today. Um, and he, in his talk, I mean his, I mean I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Feldenkrais method, uh, but you see how he learns to stand on his head, and and these and 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 that's about individual personality it's about the world outlook and it's much more than only israel or being jewish and i found that really fascinating because it sometimes gets lost and 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 when we talk about israel in the middle east we think they're all in this narrow picture but he's we're part of the larger world and we have to tell the world something and i think that's also why 46 2 is relevant yeah. i mean for ben Gurion was always like for herzl as we discussed Zionism or the state of Israel, it was more than just create another state and one state more on the map. No, it is, we have to fill this exemplary role to be a model nation, to, be, uh, to give something to the world. Ben-Gurion was very convinced of that. And maybe we can get a little sense of that in the interview. Yeah. Um, yes, um, let's, let's take Brandon. <laughs> So when the interviewer was um, asking these questions about his time at making uh, decisions in regards to defense uh, and military decisions for Israel, one of the, he kind of reflected in a philosophical way in that it, it's sort of taking it is what it is. I, you know, uh, with the information I had at the time, I made the decision that I think was the best. Uh, and I, there's no point in having any regrets. I think that's what the question was. Do you have any regrets about any of the decisions that you made? And he said, no, because given the information I had at the time, this was the best I could do, and this is what I thought was best for Israel and for you know for everyone. Um, I think that's that's that reflects very well on his philosophy, just like in regards to life. Because I think I think he responded similarly when asked about his wife's death in his response to that few months afterwards as well. And I, I guess during your time editing the film, sort of filling his shoes and you know going through the smoke and going through those 40 minute walks each day, it, did that have an impact on you as you were experiencing what, uh, experiencing just going through the editing process? And do you think you picked up some of those philosophical ideas that he's had implemented in your own life? Do you think that's also had an effect on other people working on the film, the documentary, as well mm -hmm. as people that have watched. Okay, so I'm just summarizing this very quickly. <laughs> um, the question, a uh, very good question again, is uh, that when he was asked about like the Declaration of Independence, should he wait? Was it a wrong decision? Did he risk lives maybe? He said, no, I think it was the best decision according to what I knew at the time, but we all make mistakes and so on. And then also how he reacted to his wife's death and he was like, you know, accepting it in a way. So the question was, did it mean something for you and other people on the team while making the film? What, what did it influence you, did it impact on you? Yeah, it's a personal question, so I like it. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I, was, I was completely moved by every sentence. At least I can tell you. I always thought about my children, but you know, the, the very special moment that you speak about is the great decision he made. This is what it means to be a leader. And the question of sending, I mean, soldiers, if they were not even soldiers, to, to death, this was a great decision of him. And I found it very important because the moment he decided to, de to make the declaration, the day after, he knew that he's going to send people to death. It's not funny. So this is one moment that really uh, influenced my life in a way, because sometimes you have to take decisions. Mm -hmm. Even they are hard, you know? So of course, in my daily life, I, I think about it a lot of times. So this is one moment. I just want to repeat, uh, to, to go back to a question of you that, 
you know, in the, in, in the film, I decided to put in the very first moment, the question of Clinton Bell, he said, aren't you afraid of death? You remember that? I mean, this was to put things in context that first is not young mm -hmm. and it's a very courageous question. I don't ask mm -hmm. people if they are afraid of death. I don't dare asking them. And that's what uh, I understood that he has a very intimate relationship with him, the daring asking him, your, your plans, you are going to write diaries, but, but you are not young anymore. So he said, no, I'm not ashamed. I mean, it's really characterizing. him. It's sum up yeah. at the very first moment in a very subtext way yeah. for all his personality, yeah. his age and his character. And, and as you say- You are afraid of this? But, oh, you are young. <laughs> <laughs> but as I mean, you- I mean, it's a, it's a Big question, you know. Uh, <laughs> As you say, um, yeah. it's great. It, we always talk about Ben Gurion, but actually, the questions are also amazing. And yeah. the way he talks to Ben Gurion, I was also very impressed by. By yeah. then, at the end, when Ben Gurion says, "But we still have twenty minutes, yeah, <laughs> uh, Christian," and then we'll open it to the Q and A from the questions coming in. Yeah, well, I, I was going to ask. Um, you know, we were talking about our favorite lines, but did you have any particular line or a bit of the interview that really stuck with you? Okay, there's the questions about your favorite line in the interview. My favorite lines in the interview? Mm -hmm. I, I just said, right? The the, the quotations. Uh, I like the end, and I like really all of those. Uh, <laughs> I also like the way he spoke about his wife, you know? I'm a half a man now. This I found very profound as relation between a couple. Uh, I, and, uh, I also like the uh, clips you put in, yeah. when she and she starts like, yeah. you know, a good Jewish wife would say, she starts <laughs> in the, the middle interrupting him all yeah, the time. Yeah. And getting interrupting him. him and uh, yeah. and, and, and that was, and, and you could see, or she does like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know that he cried while I was speaking mm -hmm. about it. We checked it in a big screen, you know, mm -hmm. to see if the, we see the tears. There is small tear when you say I'm half man now I mean it's it's mm. deep in coding to so this if I can add this one okay I'll yeah. see a few more that will take those first Madison what would be your ideal audience and who would be you want to create so uh, I would it's very I would answer you shortly to everybody not to the right not to the left not to it's as you said it belonged, uh, we wanted to make it more, um, how should I say it, w wider as possible, as a, as a role model mm -hmm. for leadership, for uh, ideology, for Zionism, the history of Jews, of course, but to open it to everybody, because uh, you can, you can, it, it's a role model, that's what I thought, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I, yeah. Um, uh, is it Jackson, or, oh, here, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so you were reviewing this footage 40 some odd years after it had been taken. So that means you would never had direct conversations with the subject of your documentary. If you could have been there in that room writing the questions, is there one or two that you wish you would have been able to ask? All after all of this time spent. Okay, you all have great questions. So <laughs> the question is since yeah. this film was edited 40 something years after uh yeah, the questions were asked are there any questions you would have asked which the interview yeah. how do you see israel today mm -hmm. of course i i give million dollars to give to get his answer any guesses hmm. no comments <laughs> <laughs> it's only the beginning let's say it like this i ask and i and i answer <laughs> it's only the beginning what would you like to ask him i guess if i have said anything i would have wanted to learn more about what is the essence of israel in its current time and place when he is being interviewed right after the Yom Kippur war they get touch it a little bit as to the result of the leader's actions and his somewhat disapproval of those actions but on a greater scale what is the future you know he said I am looking at it, not from the past, not from the future, but I'm looking at Israel as it is now. I would like to know what he would have said at that moment, only two years after one of the most horrific events in Israel history, but what would, uh, 
what did he see going forward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the the answer is uh, he wanted to ask him uh, what Ben Gurion would have seen as the most you know fee, looking into the future just a, a year or so after the Six Day War what was the great challenges then um, and Ola no is it sorry I'm Nadia. I'm Nadia sorry. Um, would you ever create a second film using the footage that he was not putting in the first one? What was the? Wait, can you repeat it? Um, would you ever create a film, a second film, using the footage that you did not? Include? Ah, if you would, uh, a Make second a... film which includes the footage which is not no, included. No, no, don't go back. Oh. I don't go back. I mean, it's done. It's done. Okay. That's it. It's packed. Yeah. I don't look back. I have other things too. <laughs> but, yeah, let's put that's the image from the still from the yeah. documentary. Yeah, let's leave it. Uh, let's take some questions. And again, I think, do I have to repeat it or do we hear Laura when I'll she? Try. I should, yeah, should repeat it. Okay. Okay. I think you can hear me. Um, in the interview, Ben Gurion touts the virtues that Jews and Israel should strive for. And also mentioned the USA paying for the sins of its forefathers, slavery and discrimination. Asked if Israel has achieved the virtues, he looks agonized saying no, and referring to some people doing things they should not have. Do you have a thought about what misdeeds he was referring to? Could it be the discrimination against Mizrahi Jews and the disappearance of some of their children supportedly for adoption by Holocaust survivors? And then the other question. I'll let, let, okay. Let's just wait with this. Maybe you can briefly just. You want to repeat uh, the question so if it was not clear? And I will answer. Can we find out if the audience heard the question or, it's, or was we it? Can. Okay, then. Can you repeat it for me? Ah, okay. Yeah. So basically, what was the misdeeds uh, he refers to, things that went wrong? Uh, what was he talking about? Could it be, as the question asked, maybe the relation towards Mizrahi okay. Jews or mm -hmm. other things? Mm -hmm. So the question is if, would he relate to, the, to this today? No, or? no. It was like back then. What did he think went wrong? Yeah. In yeah, the first twenty. We we tried we yeah. tried to to in the interview because we followed all the time the interview to find mistakes that he did, but we didn't find a lot during the interview. I mean, so we couldn't relate. We decided not to relate to everything. It's not the history of Israel. It's mm -hmm. the rushes we had, the, the the material we had, and with that there are a lot of topics that are not. In this film, the Mizrahim, the Ashkenazi, the, the, a lot, all the mis I mean, a lot. We just wanted to be honest with the interview and with the interviewer and try to do our best to find, for example, there are other mistakes. There were mistakes, and there will be always mistakes, but in the interview, we didn't find a lot. So we tried to, to, to stick to the interview itself in order to, to make this film. So this is my but, answer, but of course there were mistakes. And uh, one of the mistakes which we found very interesting that we put in the film mm -hmm. is the 56 war, the Sinai war. Mm -hmm. This was a very, and he admitted, he said, mm -hmm. I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I made a mistake. Would, would you like to, to put it into context, no, historical so, context? Sure. So uh, I mean, to be more precise, but that, uh, it was very important to find one mistake that is clear according to the interview and to to enlarge it, to put more material. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to- No, to stick, I, yeah. Okay. Take I hope next. I answered to yeah. the question. Well, we don't, you know, nobody answer. knows the real answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speculation. So from, from, um, in UC Santa Cruz studying film, and she was wondering if you could say more about the release of the film. Has it been released in film festivals? She was struck by Ben Gurion's thoughts about the US, his reading of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah, instance. right. Um, and wondered how it would screen in the U.S. She also wanted to know about your future projects. She studies feminist media practices and wondering if you consider your work a feminist mm. work and if you could speak more about mm -hmm. that. Very good question. When the 
guys arrived and said, where are the women? I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they arrived, the girls. So uh, this is a very nice question. So uh, I've just finished a film about a partisan uh, who was a very great partisan um, joining a, a group of partisan, not Jewish partisan in Poland. And while editing the film with the director, Woodvark, we discovered that the most, not the most, but very important part of this film will be dedicated to his wife. She was a woman, warrior. She killed people, she murdered uh, an Ukrainian guy uh, coming from a religious family that became completely, I mean, she was religious and then while well, being a partisan, she left religion. And so that's happened in editing. You begin with the subject with her husband, who is the main character in the film, and suddenly behind him, you find a woman. So uh, this is according to what's going on with women. So of course, we put her in front as much, as much as we could, because there are no documents about her. But we put a lot of images of her with a pistol, with mm -hmm all kind of this when coming to Israel she didn't speak and so on what was before the question about the him reception and, in America of in America it was yeah it was screened in a lot of Jewish film festivals it was screened in film forum in New York very good reactions very very good reactions all of you I screen it a lot in universities in educational um, uh, events all of them have the, more or less the same reaction as you have, guys. They're asking questions and uh, it raises curiosity. Uh, it's not easy to look at one past, at the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes time. Um, yeah. Yes, in the back. Ari? Yeah. Ariel? Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a question for maybe both of you. Um, uh, what, would, um, what would you both see as the most pivotal moment? So the question is, thank you. What would Ben Gurion see as the most important, most pivotal moment in his own life? And what would the Israeli people see as the most important moment in his life? Um, sorry? As well as you. Both of, you Both of us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say in his own view, uh, it is really his coming to Israel. I mean, as a young man, when he left a world which he seemed, at least that's how he saw it later. We don't know how he saw it when he was 10 years or 15 years, but he said he never felt uh, part of that world in Europe. And he left before World War I and made Aliyah, made immigra immigrated to Israel, still in the Ottoman Empire. He said that's when he was born again. He was reborn. So I think for himself, that and of course, 1948, the State of Israel, the declaration. And I think that's probably what, in my view, but I hope you have... but maybe you want to say. I just want to put it in a wide uh, it was a revolution Zionism was a revolution you know I, I look at my parents they they just followed his ideas which was not that easy because they were my mother is a is a, is a, is a, is a holocaust survivor and my father is from Brazil coming from Russia and he followed his ideas so it was really a revolution mm -hmm. at that time as as Michael said, coming to Israel, it was not yet Aliyah. It was just mm. coming to, as you saw, saw from the very first moment of my father's film, there were pioneers, you know, coming to a very hot place, <laughs> not Poland to a very, you know, Mediterranean uh, climax. So it was a revolution, a kind. So that's what I can tell you about. Did I answer you? More or less, okay. I see you. <laughs> that's, that's, but let's go on because uh, yeah. I see more uh, calls in. Yes. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I think even 
after watching your documentary, he was a very, very exemplary figure. And I think a lot of his actions seem to seem to have a huge impact on the future of Israel as a whole, where maybe some other people in that position wouldn't have done the same thing that he did. So would you say overall he was someone who affected the times or were the times affected by him? Okay, if he was someone who affected the times or were the times more... Uh, he was affected, I think, yeah, that the first... He was affected uh, by the times. Yes. You, you would say that... Yeah, I would say. That, that, that what? That, that he affected. He affected. Of course. He had, of, I, I, without any doubt. I mean, some of those decisions, obviously, like, you know, will he... Or, and it wasn't clear, even among the Zionist leadership, uh, at that day, in May 1948, would they declare an independent state or sure. wait because they knew it would mean war. Um, so that's a decision that yes or no affects clearly the state yeah. uh, as, as others as well. That's, Til, yeah. Until today, you know, a lot of decision he made that existed today. Socialist ideas mm -hmm. till today. And of Happily course, it exists yet. Of course, he was a also yeah. a very strong leader. I mean, of course, he was elected and reelected, but um, but and then at some point he resigned, and then two years later, or less than two years later, became prime minister again. Uh, but he was a very strong personality, and I imagine working under him meant uh, if you had a different opinion, it wasn't always easy. So we, we shouldn't idealize him as you know and he clearly. But but maybe it was also necessary at that time for a new state. Brian. Yeah, I was curious. Um, in the documentary, Ben Gurion talks about the military and the uh, military conscription. I think he talks about how, like, he canceled military service for six months or something along those lines. Uh, and I'm just interested that uh, typically we think of the Israeli military in terms of the job of pragmatically defending Israel, but so we have the unifying force. Do people uh, today have a conception that the military is a force for self improvement and ability for people to you know, kind of build up their lives, or is it more so just kind of seen as a necessity and people don't really think about it as much? It, it's like Ben Gurion's logic trains them. Okay, the question is about the role of Israel's military in Israeli society. And the question was not so much of Ben Gurion, but more today. If Israelis uh, view it as a necessity they have to do or something they inspire to be and, and, and like, which also forms their lives and becoming part of a united mm. society. It's a difficult question. What do you think? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, in the United States, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, my, my personal view is I definitely see the logic of it. You know, at the end of the day, like, if, if we all have something that we all do together and we build solidarity, all yeah. bonds that are virtually unbreakable. Mm -hmm. uh, especially for a state such as Israel, yeah, I can see that in that circumstance that's entirely necessary. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's at least more so in comparison to a lot of other countries, especially here in the United States. Um, I mean, I see the benefits to it, but there's also mm -hmm. cons to it, and you know, that's mm -hmm. well, you see, uh, it's it's a complicated answer because on one hand he believed in power, on the other hand he believed in peace. So these are not words. It's, and concerning the Israeli army, the IDF, um, I don't know how the word kuritur, how do you say? You believe that um, the army can stick people together. It, yeah, it's, it's like, a, a, yeah. Yeah, a it's a mixture. It's a, a, it's a blend, blend, blend yeah. of, because, you know, Yemen's together, Mizrahim, Ashkenazim. He believed, he really believed in it. I also believe that till yeah. today, the, the, these ideas still exist. Mm -hmm. If the army is good or bad, this I cannot tell you. <laughs> I'm uh, from the left wing, so. I mean, of course, I, I, yeah. I do believe that we have to find solution and to bring peace to this area, which is not that obvious today. People don't say even these words today. Less and less. We don't even pronounce the name, the the, the word, you know. Mm. So, uh, well, definitely times are very different. Uh, his own yeah. political camp is now a small, uh, marginal group yeah. in Israel, the left, and um, and also the army. Actually, the question is is interesting because Israeli society, of course, is a very different society than then. Uh, one difference is that 
a very large part um, actually do not, a much larger part than that, don't join the army because both the Arab Israeli sector and the Haredi, the ultra Orthodox sector, have grown as a percentage wise in Israel. And you have a very high percentage among very Orthodox Jews and Arab Israelis who both with few exceptions don't join the army so it is not the same <laughs> unifying force it might have might have been for almost 90 percent of the population mm -hmm. back then we have more um, questions you, i'll ask them really quickly a few and there's a lot of questions but someone uh, robin says my favorite line was when he said progressives like his wife and emma goldman were anarchists Yes, I think this is true today. Over a hundred years later, what do you think? Um, also, um, about women, someone said, "Oh, same person said we see many older Israeli statesmen when they lose their wives being truly impacted." Ben Gurion, Beg, and Rizlin. Do you think this is unique to Jewish husbands and so could it be a documentary? <laughs> and, okay, then let's just take it here. Yeah. Well, I loved. I I did know a lot about Emma Goldman, but it was clear to me that I would put in the film. I found even a sort of similarity between Emma Goldman and Paula, the same classes. And of course, it's a wonderful person. I, I really learned about her life while editing the film. So, uh, so that's what I can tell you. And I'm very happy about this remark. It's very important. It's, it's, I, I like this. A sequence in the film a lot. Several well, people asked why the interview. And she was as just English. just want to, as you. I don't know if you pay attention to it, but at the first moment, at the very, very sentence, the very first sentence about Paul, I said she was not Zionist. You know, she became. Yeah, right. I, I think it's important to emphasize it. She was not Zionist. Mm -hmm. Her role model was Emma Goldman, but it's a love story. So she followed him, you know, followed him, yeah. and then to, she followed him to, to the, the desert. <laughs> and if I compare, if I may compare, and I stand up for this, Paula in the Negev, she was, you know, just washing his clothes. She was like a simple woman. And mm -hmm. if we just compare it to Israel today, guys, with our last three minister, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not the same. What happened to us? A lot of things are not the same. Yeah, but <laughs> the whole lifestyle. Also the wives of yeah, leaders. Yeah, yeah. She was really an yeah. unbelievable woman. She followed him with love, and yeah. she, and and you know, it was I lived in the Negev. It's not yeah. funny. It's hot. Yeah. There were no air condition at the time. You know, for shooting this interview, they brought the producer. They brought in condition to the south because during the sixties yeah. there were no. And she followed him, and she lived with him. And, and remember one of the my one of my favorite scenes was when the the phone comes to the yeah door. okay love your telephone <laughs> you and, know the, yeah then, you know editing this scene i yeah. found 100 feet it's three minutes yeah point 20 seconds of this sequence yeah. it was not edited at all and i found the sound in the radio so I sat down, I said, calm down, Yael, you have to synchronize and to find points of synchronizing between the image again mm -hmm. and the sound. So when I couldn't find the synchronize, I put images, still photos, mm -hmm. just to make a sequence of it because there were, we looked for humor also, yeah. you know, humor, well, yeah. standing on the hand, not just being, yeah. you know, ideologic and yeah. too much didactic. So, last question. Last question. And I sit I down again. <laughs> why why the interview was in English mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. very good one so I will give you a very uh, short answer the producer were British so he thought that it would be a good business also to make short films in English and it would be international it caused a lot of problem in Israel the channel, the commercial channel, TV channel, didn't want the interview, didn't buy it, didn't want, because it's in English. He said, why doesn't he speak in Hebrew? So at the beginning we were, I even didn't think about it. And they said, oh, it's, we will not take it because it's in English. After, of course, they understood that make a mistake, but for so me- So they it have was, it with subtitles. Yeah, of course. So actually my, maybe one last question. Mm. Why was it not, made into a, a documentary released in 19, 
but as long as he was alive. Because we didn't know where the Russians No, were. but ah. right then, in 1968, 69, 70. We don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. Because that is amazing. They yeah. made, they went into all this effort. Should it cost also we money? No, yeah. And then they just let it in the archive, leave yeah. in the archives. Did you want mm. to see the other? Ah, we can show you. Thank you, Laura. So I uh, just to sum it up, I will show you too. Steve's photo. This is during the interview. This is my father's film, 426. He's behind this. My father took this picture just to let you know that it was it all happened. It really happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is this one. This is oh, my father. Okay. So oh, very nice. My father, Plus, and this is our yeah. Ben Gurion during the shooting. Who is in the middle? Uh, it's one of his um, uh, good friends. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great picture. Well, thank you so much, Yael. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really nice. And thank, thank you all for your questions in the classroom, yeah, on the wonderful. screen. And um, we're all looking forward to seeing your new film. Yeah. <laughs> So we will have a common, shall we take pictures as I did in uh, Boston? Those who, all of you? who yeah. don't have to run, yeah. let's take a picture. If... <laughs>